Brilliant. So, hello, Paul Thompson and John Watterson. Oh, Watterson, yep. Watterson. You Watterson, know, that's, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, that, I well, can't. that's his name. That's how I always pronounce it. And he's never corrected me. So I think we're all right. <laughs> it's got double T. Have I got that wrong? Right? It's got double T, yeah. Oh, but is that right? Is it got, um, is Waterson spelt like that? Sound interesting. That must be a Yorkshire thing, perhaps. Possibly. Well, well, he, well, he's from the Isle of Man, you see. So uh, originally, although he's, I think he's, uh, he's got all of the tones of a Yorkshireman, I think. I think he, he's gone native as he's been living in Yorkshire for quite a while. But uh, yeah, originally from the Isle of Man, Manxman. Yeah, three legs. That's brilliant. Um, so, but we're not here to talk about John Watterson or yourself, Paul Thompson. You are here because you are the joint authors of a new book about Jake Thackeray, a really long book, really <laughs> read, um, full of autobiographical detail. Oh my gosh, lots of interviews, lots of research, lots of love for Jake Thackeray. So maybe actually, maybe let's start off by explaining who Jake Thackeray is to maybe a new generation as well as an older generation. Certainly. So Jake was a Yorkshire-born, a Leeds-born singer-songwriter who became famous at the end of the 60s, largely through his television appearances. He became almost a national figure through appearing night after night on Braden's Week, which was a, a Saturday night show that went out after Match of the Day. And he wrote songs which were uh, satirical, which were comic, which were poignant, which were hilarious, which could sometimes be a bit close to the edge and a bit rude, and but full of storytelling. And there's nothing quite like them. So he's a complete one off, a true original, and a great poet as well. Um, and he was in his heyday, creatively and in terms of his fame in the early 70s. Uh, but fame didn't sit well with him. So he didn't really like television. He didn't really trust show business. So he's very much pulled away from all of that as time went on and uh, went to the clubs and the folk clubs that he loved playing in the intimate places. So, but he had a, a stellar recording career, half a dozen albums. He recorded at Abbey Road Studios. He, the, B -B, the Beatles admired him and uh, liked his guitar style. So he's a really interesting, an interesting man and a bit of, uh, somebody that we, John and I are both passionate about the songs of because we think they're so wonderful and sadly he passed away about well 20 years ago this Christmas and John and I with various other fans have really I think set it as our life's mission to pass on these wonderful songs and writing the book was a an utter joy and you know the the origins of that lie very much with John he was the person who got the ball rolling um, but it's a fascinating life of a man who produced an extraordinary collection of songs. And which one of you two wonderful authors is Fake Thackeray? That is John. So John is the original fake. Uh, we have to we have to have to admit that. Uh, so we both perform, uh, but John is the one who has uh, you know it travels most extensively to all corners. Once he's once he's got his voice, unfortunately at the moment he has lost his voice. But uh, uh, yeah, he is Fake Thackeray. And so you both perform, so you must both be guitarists and songwriters and performers, singers. Yeah, we're, we're, we're both guitarists and singers. I started um, playing the double bass as well, probably about a dozen years ago, because Jake often had a double bassist with him and it worked really well with the songs. So when John and I are playing together, often John will be singing and playing the guitar and I'll play double bass for him. And then on other occasions, I'll, I'll play guitar and sing. And uh, uh, John's done a little bit of songwriting. Um, I've done, we, John and I recorded an album of songs which I'd written with a comic novelist, which are in the style of Jake Thackeray and Georges Brassens, who was Jake's great sort of French uh, songwriting mentor and hero. Uh, so yeah, we, we, so we put ourselves around a bit. <laughs> Yeah, so it's. I think it's really nice that people who are authors also have that empathy through having a performing uh, relationship. You can understand the trials and struggles of performance, I think, if you are a practitioner yourself. Let's have a quick, let's, let's have a little skate through Jake's career, maybe from beginning to end, because I remember him when he was on television, and I think a lot of people uh, my age will have the same experience. And it was odd 
to see him on television because he didn't seem to fit in with the kind of people who normally came on television as musicians and performers and songwriters. You expected him to perhaps to be a, a topical, satirical kind of uh, singer um, because of the kind of slots he got, but yet he often didn't write about um satirical stuff but what he did right was very adult kind of songs about adult about relationships and a very kind of yeah adult perspective which was odd as a child listening to his material because it's not really material for children at all in the terms of it's very literary it's it it seems to be humorous but it's not a kind of humor that a, a child really gets and I was a child at the time so I remember being rather bemused by him slightly put off because obviously he's got these complex lines that sort of spill over and um yeah it was an, an odd choice and amazing really uh programming thing that the bbc did put him on so much but um yes an enigma so let's scoot through his life and as a performer yeah so his life as a performer he so he was teaching in leeds in the early in the mid 60s in a secondary modern and started very, very quickly writing, learned the guitar. Within a couple of years of starting to play the guitar, he was writing songs. And he was sort of discovered by a BBC producer, actually of a, of a country programme, a programme about the countryside and agricultural affairs, who realised, and so spoken language stuff, she realised he was brilliant. She got him onto what was then called the North East Home Service, before we had Radio Leeds. But so that was in late 65. By early 66, she was championing him and he started turning up on Look North, which uh, the, the regional news programme, heading over to Manchester to record that or perform live, perhaps. And then it was the big time really came in 1968. So by then he'd got a recording contract, was working at, at Abbey Road, was still teaching because he, yeah, he enjoyed teaching. He didn't really see the need to give it up. But then he was persuaded by people around by his producer and his agent that actually he ought to go for it and turn professional. So that happened around about 68. And Beryl Reed, if you remember her, this of the very versatile comic actress, had a little sort of showcase show. And he appeared on that. And it was that was the moment where suddenly he became you know, a recognized figure. And then he made the transition so that I'm I remember him from That's Life in the 70s. And before That's Life, there was a very similar show which had Esther Rance on it, but she wasn't the lead figure, um, called Braden's Week. And he got onto that in late in 68. And Braden's Week, he was on for six months, every single week. And as you say, his songs were, as I think the BBC always had a problem of, well, quite where does he fit? Because they're not mainstream songs. They're very intelligent. He doesn't patronise his audience. He uses weird words and you know, sophisticated language and interesting ideas. And he's always coming at things from a different way. And so Braden's week, he was doing a song a week. And as you say, some of the songs were about the news events. So each week he would set out to write one about that week's events, like the Miss World contest. Um, but quite often he would then just pick a song actually that he'd already got in the bottom drawer. And you, but the viewers were list treated to week after week, a different song, a new song. Uh, and that went on pretty much for four years. So he, it was tremendous pressure. It was effectively live TV to what, 15 million people, uh, three channels. So it was a, a really big thing. And it, so he became a household name through that show. And for a lot of people of a certain generation, you know, his name is synonymous with Braden's Week. He is the star of Braden's Week. Um, but later on, yeah, he really, I think, quite soon realized that they, this was a very limited thing to be doing and it, he hated the pressure he hated staring into the red light of the camera uh his apparently his he would tell friends that he had kept his hand in his pocket whilst he waited because his leg was shaking so much with the idea of you know you don't want to make a mistake in front of 15 million people uh so as time went on he pulled away from television work i think he regarded it all a bit too manufactured a bit to manage you know you had idiot boards for the audience to to clap and laugh at certain times and that wasn't his bag because he was he was a man who working class man who really valued authenticity you know it mattered greatly to him to be grounded he didn't believe in fame he didn't believe in showbiz he rather distrusted all of it even though 
you know, his talent had taken him into that area. Yeah, he's very much uh, from a folk tradition. Um, and um, yeah, from the Yorkshire base. I know that he's got one song about uh, that I've heard about his aunt. I think it's his aunt Molly, who was a, she, a shepherd. Shepherdess, yeah. So, I mean, it's true that, I mean, he's written some really beautiful songs about, and some hard songs, and that's a very tragic song about this poor sheep minder, I think he calls her, who's on, stuck on the, has a wretched existence, living a short life on the moor side, so that other people, you know, ladies can have fine clothes and counterpanes and so on, wealthier people, better people, this sort of working class ethic that he had an outlook on things very left-wing always informed his writing but to a great extent and he's got other songs another song called the rain on the mountainside which is just the most gorgeous beautiful song but about the harsh nature of the harsh beauty of the north country and the toughness of the people who have to go out and work on the fields and work on the hills but the his his greatest influence on his writing probably it well it certainly was um, French. It was this man Georges Brassens and this French tradition of poetic songs, songs where the words are the most important thing, uh, a tradition of, um, I suppose, uh, anarchy, uh, the anarchists really, that's people, uh, the non-conformists and people who are writing stories and songs about, you know, working people and so on. And many of the, a lot of the influence on his right, his style of singing, and the themes he picked draw from that rather than from an English tradition, in, interestingly. But the folk yeah, clubs... I think when you hear him, if you know both writers, you can really see that connection with Georges Brasson. I think Georges Brasson is more kind of... He sort of survived. I think he's somebody who listeners to this show will know better than they know yes. Bradbury, even though this is a show in London to people who are interested in arts and music. I'm sure they'll be more familiar with Georges Brasson. And uh, I don't know what this is. Is this something to do with the UK mentality of not valuing so much homegrown performers or and to enjoying the slightly exotic nature of somebody uh, from a French tradition um, and not oh. valuing the English pe uh, speaking uh, tradition quite as much or or whatever it is maybe you've got I, I think it could be that I think the other I mean I think Jake would have been delighted with what you've just said because Jake valued George's talent far more highly than he valued his own and Jake I mean famously Jake and George performed in 1973 at a concert in Wales at the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff and on that occasion Jake was the support act and the whole thing was done through friendship. He was a friend of Brassens by then. The event had been organized by a French lecturer at Cardiff University who was a mutual friend of them both. Uh, Jake wouldn't even, Jake was invited to do the encore with Brassens and turned it down because I think largely because he didn't feel that he was worthy to, to tread the same. Board. And yet his greatest writing, in my view, matches Brassens and really does he stretches there and he produces songs like The Bull or The Remembrance, which are as extraordinary and as powerful and as poetic as brass sounds. But I think one of the problems is that in the English tradition, there is a lack of regard. As soon as somebody is a comic writer, there is a lack of respect, I suppose, or it doesn't carry the same kudos as somebody who is regarded as a serious. You know, comic writers are not taken seriously. Well, and that's Brassens. an interesting point um, that about the yeah the attitude towards people who use comedy in their work. Um, it, it's funny. It's, it's funny that this should be the case because in many other cultures, uh, the comedy is valued as being a really important um, entertainment uh, quality and and to be worthy of great respect. And uh, I think we we accept it when people come from other uh, yeah. traditions. But yeah. And for Thackeray, it was, I mean, he, I mean, he talked about this. In fact, there's a, we're, and one of the other projects I'm involved with is involved, is going to be the release of a BBC licensed double DVD set in November. And on that, Jake, there's a bit of, I mean, it's mainly about performances, but Jake was in one programme talking about this issue, about why he wrote comic, I mean, it's not that all his work is comic, but he was saying the beauty of a comic song is if you tell a joke, you tell it once and people have heard the joke. It doesn't bear repeating or really uh, uh, when it comes to a comic song, he said, if you write it well, 
people will listen again and again and it get enjoyment and appreciation of it. So he was a sophisticated man who understood the power of comedy and that you could achieve great things in writing in comedy. But yes, I suppose that there is a certain sort of intellectual snobbery uh, that I think that we perhaps suffer from. Yeah, I think it is suffering because uh, um, I think in music, it's very important to have humour. It's a very important musical quality um, in actual fact, in, in terms of voice or in terms of playing and lines and everything. And um, I mean, we all accept that when it comes to somebody like, let's say Mozart, who has a lot of humour in his work. Um, we accept that that's an intrinsic part of his genius. Uh, but it's this, uh, It's also just generally music. Humour is really important in yep. communication and in support. Yeah, and we would say the same thing, I suppose, of Stephen Sondheim. You know, there is a somebody who managed this brilliant fusion of wit in his right in his work as in this musical theatre, as well as being able to say, you know, think to move people and say profound things. So I think I'm not. I don't think everyone gets quite the same um, sort of fair play in terms of how their reputation might go. But I suppose for Jake, the other part of it is probably just being stymied by this TV. Uh, oddity uh, dimension to it and never quite escaping from that that doing the one song as the comic song item uh, on a late night tv show yeah that that it sort of feels a bit more throwaway as a, as a slot if you like and yeah. never yeah in, in the popular imagination it yeah that ended up being I think a bit of a uh, of a, a weight around him really yeah, I think somebody like Pam Ayres probably has got similar type of uh, prejudice against her because she's actually an extraordinarily funny and communicative woman who does many things, including when she performs, she's quite a uh, sl slapstick. She, you know, she plays her own deadpan character as well as the one who delivers the jokes. And yeah. she's a songwriter, she's a folk songwriter. But again, she's somebody who will be kind of like put down as though one sort of believes the... Uh, the, the role she's playing yes and, and I think and I think the other thing that goes and I think this is true of her as well as, as Jake that in a sense you think of the comic numbers you know rather than thinking or comic poems rather than thinking about actually she's written some things which have, really have a point to make and that's certainly true of, uh, of some of Jake's writing that uh, yeah there, there's a lot going on and I think it's that pigeonholing effect that we yeah so people seem to have and do you think it's also a regional thing, perhaps, as well, when people have strong regional roots and accents that they put over and they speak from it, combined with the comedy element, that that has a, a double thing? I think you get that with certain accents have got um, attributes that people associate with them, um, that beyond the area where the accents predominate, there's a cultural resonance that's become accepted to I, th I think that could be part of what goes on. And certainly Jake was unashamedly Northern, was determined that he was never going to lose his vowels. Uh, you know, he, wa he wasn't uh, about to try to, to sharpen up and make become more BBC uh, in his delivery. And if he does so occasionally, he does it to mock it uh, rather than anything else. So it goes back to him wanting to be true to himself. But I think, it, again, he talked, I mean, he didn't give many interviews, but early on when he would talk in interviews about moving south, he would talk about that, that northern sense of inferiority moving to the, the soft um, fatlands of, uh, of the south, as he put it, the teal peppy belt of, uh, uh, along the corridor of the Thames to near, near London. So he was quite, you know, he was quite suspicious of and dismissive of the South, but I think probably the problem is that a lot of the attitude of the South in terms of the media terms to the North would, yeah, again, pigeonhole him. Well, he's he's a Northern comic singer, isn't he? And that is used as a as a stick, really, rather than as a recognition of his talent. Yeah, but you've certainly this is what's very much needed to preserve his legacy and to give people an understanding of him. Very good time to do it while a lot of people who know him are still alive and you can interview people. Yes, absolutely. And the and one of the joys of of working with John on the book was that we, you know, I mean he's obviously we've got we got to interview lots of people who knew him and friends, and that included friends in the media, but also but the I think one thing we're very keen to do as part of uh, is a, is reach out so that a, a younger audience, and we see this coming through now, and you see it through, I don't know, the likes of John Richardson 
um, making fun of his own admiration for Jake, the comedian on his Meet the Richardsons mockumentary. And that has an effect. I mean, that's t certainly started to bring Jake to d a different, to a new audience. And there's a certain pleasure in performing Jake's songs or introducing Jake to people who've never come across him before. It's, it's an absolute delight because you know that these songs are going to absolutely smack them between the eyes uh, and they'll get so much out of it. Yeah, the, the songs are so strong. Um, yeah, let's pick a couple of songs and talk about them and, and perhaps play them uh, peppered throughout the show. Let's um, select now a couple of songs that might um, be... Uh, yeah, particular interest. I'd quite like to play. I must admit, the one about the shepherd is oh, shepherd. Old Molly Metcalf, yes, yeah. which is yeah, a beautiful and haunting. And as you say, that's probably of all the songs he wrote. It's the it gets mistaken for being a traditional song. It's so folky, and it uh, was one that Jake effectively sang a, a cappella. He, uh, as I say, builds the story of a young girl as young shepherd minder. And the hard, hard life and death she experiences up on the moors. Yeah, I think it finishes on her back in the bracken with frozen bones. And the refrain the song uses is from Swaledale. Jake visited Swaledale in 1970 mm. um, as part of making a little programme about how life in that very beautiful but remote North Yorkshire Valley was changing at that time. And he picked up on the fact that the Swaledale she shepherds still used their own counting system, Yan Tan Tether Mother Pip, one, two, three, four, five. And he uses that as a refrain in the song. And it's, uh, in fact, we, we nicked in at our editor's suggestion and used the same counting system in the chapters in the book, which we thought would be quite uh, a nice tribute to the song. But it is a, it's a beautiful uh, and poetic, but very bleak uh, and dark picture of this poor girl. Um, on her back in the bracken with frozen bones. Daft yeah, Molly I Metcalf. like it particularly because it's very respectful of women, whereas some of other Jake Thackeray songs certainly put me off when I was younger because he does seem to sort of have a uh, um, depict women often. I mean, he he takes those cliches of women talk too much and um, uh, in a couple of songs and, and a couple of those things. And they did put me off when I was okay. younger because I, I found, you know, women were sort of a little bit, was a little bit too sexualized and a little bit too... Um, uh yeah it's like um, nagging and um and I, mean, I, think, I, I think that's interesting I mean that's interesting I, mean, I think that you know that's there in the songs but <clears> at the same <throat> time if you listen to a song like La Di Da he's also happy a go at the bore of a far future father-in-law yeah who goes on about the runs he used to score mm. and how he won the war he he has you know characters who are you know, drunken old sots and so on. So I think in many ways, I think he, he takes lots of the the um, uh, caricatures of certain types of behaviour and he applies them left, left right and centre. A song I'd always point to, to anybody though, to say that it's, it's more complex is uh, The Hair of the Widower Bridlington, which is a fantastic song about tolerance and about uh, liberate about a woman who is li living the life she wishes to lead and you know they, it's a decidedly decidedly different and I think quite enlightened in terms of the attitude and the story he tells there but you know there, yeah, I there think is, he partly like, suffers from uh, coming from a time when there was so much misogyny and the way people talked about women so that does seep in a little bit probably yeah. because he's a child of his generation and because he's also writing about what's around him but I, I and I do agree with you. I think it's um, it's a lot of pom pompous figures that he will pull down and, um, and that tradition. Absolutely, and I think that yeah, he was a he was an anarchist through and through, and he was no respecter of authority and no respecter of hierarchies and didn't believe in deference. Uh, so his working class roots, which very much tie in, I think. And both, and, and he came from the terraces of Leeds. It was a hard upbringing. Um, he had a very devout Catholic mother, a, re, a quite brutal policeman father, um, who uh, who was demoted. And the family, in the, the family legend was, and there's yeah, you know, there, there's reason why they would think this, but no proof of it. But the family legend was because the father had a run-in with a bigwig, uh, you know, somebody important. 
uh, when he was out on police duty and a, and a month or two later he found that he'd been knocked from being sergeant to to constable so you sort of feel that's in terms of coloring and flavoring and affecting jake's worldview it's not surprising that so many of his songs uh really he has got a thing about authority and uh I mean, most gloriously, I suppose, there's a song called Pass, the, Pass My Lord, The Rooster Juice, which is all about um, you know, the sexual impotence of the aristocracy. And it was written as a point number inspired by a Barbara Cartland book promoting honey as an aphrodisiac, of all things. And she supposedly invited to the launch party exclusively members of the aristocracy. And Jake thought that was, that was quite interesting. So he turns this throwaway news item into this fabulous satire about the decline of the ruling classes and it has this line um uh their rampant crests are withering and wilting and it serves the cocky thoroughbreders right uh yeah he's got there's got a certain amount of spleen in some of the writing yeah and i think he does use sex as a satirical tool as well i mean rabelais and that french tradition of using uh sexuality i mean that the very very famous song gorilla about a yes. sex crazed gorilla would be an example, which of course, uh, which of course was uh, his adaptation of of, Jacques, of Georges Brassens, and yet a superb piece of song by Brassens, and it, uh, as it has been said, it takes a poet to produce such a wonderful adaptation that works in English. But yes, uh, but brother gorilla, the, this gorilla on, you know, I think a song that arguably works on two levels. On the one level, it's a critique of the behaviour of the judiciary in France, who guillotined resistance fighters collaborated with the Vichy government and the Nazis and on the same but he does this and Brassens does this and Thackeray does through uh, the story at the tale of this uh, runaway gorilla that escapes its cage at the village circus and only two people aren't foolish enough to run away from it and one is a little old lady and the other is a judge and the gorilla has poor eyesight and decides to go for the judge in order to get its sexual gratification so uh yeah quite a quite a, a tasty song and uh you know not not for the faint-hearted in 1952 when Brassens wrote it and I know that it got banned from national radio in France and Brass and Thackeray just thought it was a fantastic piece and did a fantastic job of adapting it yeah I mean that is such a famous song for him uh, in his adaptation and how it came off on British TV yes absolutely and jake delivering it with that deadpan that he developed as his style when he was you know, very i think the word that gets trotted out for his delivery is lugubrious and he did have that he realized actually just keeping a straight face as many a comic would say when you're singing something that's funny actually just makes it funnier yeah he certainly had a a very good expressive face for the work that he'd set himself do you have a particular favorite um i love there's a, a song called the remembrance which is well if i got two the remembrance is it, i think the greatest anti-war song ever written and it's it's got something i studied uh, I, I was a classics teacher and studied classics and it's got something of homer's iliad in it and the ending of the iliad where achilles and priam are enemies and yet they are brought together by their mutual suffering and their humanity and realizing they're both going to die and there's something about in this song because Jake goes through and denounces patriotism glory and religion as the, if you like the lies told to get people to fight and then the final verse the soldier who's been sent off to fight who has heard these lies a month before a week before and the night before the night before the raid um his captain has given him said you know let fame and glory spur you on and all of this is yeah a week before he dies um and the final thing that he that seconds before he dies we're left with the last verse so remember the shock of the ambuscade remember the terrible fusillade and how we all looked up to see the curious face of the enemy who was young and shabby and seemed to be about as foreign as you or me. I never did catch what the poor sod said when he made sure he was dead. And this was a couple of shakes before we got killed in the war. And it's, uh, I think it's just an utterly remarkable and moving piece of writing. So that's a particular favourite, a very late song. It's only just appeared 
uh, from the do- from the gloom, I suppose, after 40 years. It was on Jake's last album, Jake Thacker in Songs, and uh, it's just been released on streaming and download services, uh, that album. And it's just a brilliant, very moving, poetic song. Um, another one, odd enough, on the same album, but it's the song that gave us the title for the book, the book uh, uh, Beware of the Bull, uh, The Enigmatic Genius of Jake Thackeray, is a song called The Bull, which... Uh, came out in 1981 and in it uh, we gave it the it became the title of the book because it is Jake's worldview it is uh, his view that you should never trust people above you that you should always view everything they do with skepticism and the bigger the bull the bigger the bull if you pardon my language the bigger the balls the bigger the bull the bigger and quicker and thicker the bull shite falls and uh, it seems to me that that song has a certain timeless resonance um uh, when we look at the world around us. Exactly, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, and, and being Jake, uh, not only is he, he, does he use it to deal with any sort of hierarchy or authority, but the last verse, as so often, he turns on himself and he mocks his own celebrity and tells his audience, don't trust me. You know, how wonderful it would be if we all just stood up and sang before this bloke started singing, beware of the bull. Yeah, you know, don't trust what he says. Yeah, such an interesting songwriter because it's not like there's many great choruses for people to sing along to. It's very much like a, a, a literary kind of approach to songwriting. I mean, yes. like a Dylan without the choruses. Well, exactly. In fact, the Beware of the Bull is, I was, when we were writing the book, we realised it's one of the very few that does have a chorus mm. because Jake doesn't engage in, if you like, filler. There is no filler in his songs. And in the Bull, there is a chorus because it's the perfect vehicle for what he wants to do, because he wants it to be the rallying call for everyone. But it do, it's one of the peculiar and interesting challenges of uh, singing his songs. You realise, you know, it, as you say, they're very literary. There is no wasted space. There's no unnecessary repetition. There's no lazy writing. I'll, I'll give you an example by comparison. Victoria Wood is a great, was a great talent. Her most famous song, which I love performing, is Let's Do It, the Ballad of Freedom Barry, which is littered with great punchlines and great jokes. But along the way, there are lines which are clearly there to provide a rhyme in order to set up a brilliant joke. In Jake's songs, I can't think of a single one where there's a line of filler in order to be able to get to the end point. So... The level of detail in his writing, I think, is extraordinary. You you change a word at your peril. You lose a word. Yeah, he's at more your of peril. a through writer. I mean, to be fair, to Victoria Word, it's a slightly different style. Not that um, I'm, I don't, I might agree with you, but um, but he's more of a through composed kind of lyricist, I'd say, which is yes. means he goes from one point to another rather than um, from a point to point kind of. Yeah. Uh, style we're going to do this in a moment so why don't because zoom is going to cut us off so let's regroup say okay. anything we need to say and then do any housekeeping because we're really we're yeah. pretty good we've got most of the beef of it all now so great yeah, cool let's um yeah it says less than one minute so it's going to kill us any second yeah that's fine but but i, I think you're exa- i think that's in- exactly right there there is no yeah, the songs are just beautifully constructed. They've been thought through. And the, yeah, he just maintains a standard in the writing right the way through, in my view. The, it's, uh, it, it's just remarkable. Yeah, in my sort of floundering around with my bits of songwriting, which 